going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Ten days ago, for the first time in 16 years, a Democratic governor delivered the Ohio State of the State Address. On March the 14th, Ted Strickland addressed the Ohio House and Senate to lay out his vision, which was followed the next day by the delivery of his proposed biennium budget. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. With an economy that continues to struggle, combined with ongoing tax reforms that have the impact of reducing revenue, the recommended budget presented by Governor Strickland suggests only 3.2 percent growth in spending over two-year life of the budget. That's well below the state appropriation limit of 7.1 percent. So the issue is not new programs so much, but how the available resources will be focused. To discuss the direction proposed by Governor Strickland, I am joined this morning by Steve Driehaus, who represents the 31st Ohio House District, the western part of the city of Cincinnati and beyond. Representative Driehaus is a Democrat in his fourth term and serves as the minority whip in the House. He is a member of the Finance and Appropriations Committee and Senator Robert Schuler. Senator Schuler's district covers the eastern Hamilton County and all of Warren County. Senator Schuler, a Republican, sits in his second, is in his second term in the Senate and has previously served in the House. Senator Schuler is the chair of the Energy and Public Utilities Committee and serves on Ways and Means. Welcome to Newsmakers. Thanks, Dan. And uh, let's begin. Uh, Steve, your whole time up in Columbus, um, <laughs> relatively short, uh, you're just in your fourth term. Uh, you've never had a Democratic governor. You've always been in the minority. What was it like and what was your reaction to the uh, a, a Strickland's State of the State Address? Well, I, it, it was a great speech. And, you know, I, I think there was just a, a feeling of excitement. There was a feeling of, you know, we're doing something new here. Uh, and there's a feeling of bipartisan cooperation. At least that's what I got, you know, from the governor's speech. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that, you know, where we're starting in this process is, is a very bipartisan effort by the governor uh, to reach out to everyone and say, look, I, I'm going to work with the Republicans. I'm going to keep their tax structure from the last budget in place. I am going which to... Which is a continuing rolling back of certain types of taxes, which absolutely. were passed. Absolutely. And those are still being implemented, so he's not right. going to stop that. He's and, going to accept and then it. he said, and I'm going to adhere to fiscal discipline, which I said during the campaign. He went and got every department in the state to cut their budgets by 5% to free up some funding, and then um, he's got the slowest growth budget in over 40 years. So, you know, he's sticking to his promises, yet he's laying out a vision for the state, which is very exciting. As so. a Democrat, do you feel okay with that? Or is it, is, uh, are you disappointed? Are you, did you want more? What? No, I'm, I'm not disappointed at all. I think it's very exciting. Somebody said something to the effect that, you know, there was a state of the state last week and a governor showed up. And, you know, it was interesting that, you know, you have Ted Strickland there, and, and, and you feel sitting in that seat listening to the speech, what, we've got a leader. We've got someone that's going to provide direction, that's going to provide a vision for the state of Ohio. So it was exciting, and, and I feel good about it. Now, we haven't worked out all the details of the budget, obviously, right. um, but I'm very supportive of what I've seen so far. Bob, you've been in the majority in, the, in both the House and in the Senate, and you've had a, go a Republican governor. So this was a new experience for your side of the aisle as well. What was your reaction to the presentation? Right, Dan. Well, I started out in the minority, uh, but with a Republican governor, and uh, so I've. Uh, this is the third governor I've seen give a speech, and I think it was the best delivered state of the state speech really? that I've seen. Uh, yeah, he he did a very good job of it. As somebody said to me afterwards, boy, he looks like a governor. He talks like a governor. And I thought that was the case, uh, mm -hmm. and I thought that he presented himself as wanting to be bipartisan and wanting to work uh, with the majority Republicans in the legislature. What about this, um, you know, what, what Steve was talking about, the acceptance of the, con of the Republican proposal for tax cuts, which got passed, and this very slow growth, low growth budget. How do you feel about that? Well, there were things, Dan, in the budget that I agreed with the governor on. There were some I disagreed with him on. There were some that I agreed, but I would have done it differently. And I really agreed with the fact that he stuck with that. And yeah, he's uh, actually the budget the first uh, year is going down 1.6, right. and then That's it's right. going up 6% the next year. So overall, it's still under that statutory limit that we set. 
and he's uh, continuing the tax reforms that the Republicans made. So, you know, I think that's wise. I, I think that will help us to work with him. The allocation within that budget's where I have some and we'll problems. And we'll get to that in a minute here. But, but, you know, it's the budget, as you look at it, is incredibly creative. So at the same time that we're keeping growth very, very slow, he's offering an enormous tax credit uh, on property taxes for seniors in the state of Ohio. And the disabled. One in, seniors and the disabled. One in four property tax owners will see relief uh, up to 25, the first 25 percent or $25,000 of their property value will not be taxed under this plan because of some very creative things that are being done in this budget. Similarly, he's taking dollars, federal dollars that we haven't accessed in the past, Workforce Investment Act dollars, where we rank 51st in accessing those dollars. He's taking That's those That's counting dollars. the District of Columbia, exactly. I presume. Otherwise, I how mean, do we I, get to 51st? Well, it's, it's astounding, you know, that, that right. we are so bad in accessing those federal dollars. He's using those dollars, thus enabling him to free up dollars through TANF, which is former welfare money, to put toward early childhood education and ensuring young people in the state of Ohio. Bob, you were saying, though, there were some things that, in terms of the appropriations, that you disagreed with. What would be the most serious area? Well, one of the, the main things, uh, as Steve mentioned, as uh, far as creative, was the securitization of the tobacco money. And I agree with that. Joe Dieters uh, suggested that uh, when he was a treasurer of the state, and I agreed with it then, I agree with it now. It's how that money is spent. What do you mean by that? What, and, and both the securitization and how it's spent. What Basically, Dan, what securitization is, is that the, with the tobacco settlement, there's money coming in every year for several years. What securitization, we sell those obligations, get that money up front from people who are willing to invest in that money so that we have it now. It's a great time to do it, my understanding, from t talking to people in New York because there are a lot of people that want to invest. Privatization is a big thing now and people want to invest in this government money and so we could get that money now we could use it so you future. like that part of it you I don't like, like that part what don't you like about it okay I like the idea of property tax relief I don't like the targeted idea where there are there are working families that have low incomes that won't be targeted there are millionaires and multimillionaires who will get tax breaks just because of their age I think that pits one group of taxpayers against the well, another group. Again, that was an effort to be bipartisan because I think the governor felt that if we put means testing on this property tax relief, then in fact he would get a lot of opposition from the Republicans, so he made it across the board. But here's a Republican the, saying well, he doesn't and, like that. But understand, you know, the governor's rolling out of the budget is the beginning of the conversation. And right. our role as legislators is to have that conversation over the next several months. What was fascinating about the securitization, and you should view it as kind of a, a lottery payout. You know, you take the payout up front or you take it, you know, mm -hmm. across years. What's fascinating, fascinating about it is that we're taking that money and, and that then allows us to forego floating bonds on the market for the next three years, general obligation bonds and common school bonds. That frees up $250 million a year over the next 20 years, which then allows for the property tax relief. $250 million a year in terms of what we would have to pay, pay in debt service. Right, so, right. right, that we're it's not going to be paying. significant. Yes, it's absolutely. Significant. And where, where I look at, Dan, on that, I don't believe that you should mortgage your house to go on a vacation. But so if that money is used correctly and it's used for building schools and to free up that money and that money is used correctly, that's the point we have to look at. And this well, property tax relief isn't out forever on that because after 2012, then we're going to start using general fund money for that property tax relief. But you know, it's, it's for 20 years and we meet all of the obligations that are in place in terms of school construction in the state of okay, Ohio. Let's, and that, that's debate. That's being debated. Okay, and and this is a conversation that will now start. That's the purpose mm -hmm. of a budget to right. get the conversation. Let's let's talk, talk about a couple of focus things. Uh, Bob, you're on the Energy Committee. There are some real. Uh, he, uh, the governor wants to invest a billion dollars in various kinds of energy development. I mean, everywhere we look right now, whether it's in Washington, D.C., or it's in Columbus, people are talking about what can we do more creatively on energy. What did you think about the governor's proposals? Well, the, ju just the governor doesn't want to invest a, a billion dollars. He wants to encourage investment of a billion dollars by giving what they call volume cap. In order, other words, allow private companies or individuals to borrow money using the uh, state 
uh, volume cap, which means they get a much lower interest rate. So that's an encouragement, and I'm glad to see that. We've got lots of corn in Ohio. We've got a lot of companies that make things that can be used for energy efficiency, whether it's uh, like alternatives like <coughs> wind, where mm -hmm. General Electric can make turbines, we got bearing companies, we got corn that can be used in ethanol. We need to encourage those things, and, I, and that's one of the things I agree with the governor so, on. So you, you, you're supportive of that, and you sit on a committee that's related. Correct. Well, we have to do it, and, and as a state, we've been sitting still as the rest of the states around us are moving forward on new technologies around energy. Uh, the state of Ohio, you know, hasn't been moving nearly as quickly. And the governor said, look, we want to create investment. We want to encourage investment in ethanol. We want to encourage investment in wind and solar and, you know, fuel cells. And, and that's what we're trying to do. And but, I put uh, last year $9 million into a fund to kick off this, this wind power. And uh, it's been spent now. And I'm, I'm glad to see that because it's, it is good for Ohio. But another really important part of this is that at the same time we're investing in these technologies, he's investing in the people. And, you know, the governor recognizes that tuition costs in the state of Ohio have gotten out of hand. He's doing something. He's trying to hold those at zero percent in the first year and three percent the second year. If the universities of the state of Ohio when the, come together. When the average has been nine percent. Right. And, and since 2000, I don't know that people know this about the General Assembly, but the reason tuitions are increasing is because the General Assembly hasn't given universities the increases. Since 2000, they've been essentially flat funded. So they've had to raise tuition in order to keep up with their costs. So now the governor's stepping in and saying, look, if we're going to transform this economy, we have to be investing in the workers of the future. You do that by investing in your universities and making them accessible to students across the state. This whole area of education is one of the biggest areas. And I, I, we could, it's too complex. We don't have enough time to do everything. But let's listen to something the, the governor said, and then I want to focus it a little bit. Let's, let's listen to this. As we take on questions of reform, as we take on questions of funding, the goal must be absolutely clear. We will have public schools that serve our children's needs, all of our children. Three concrete recommendations that <coughs> flow from that principle, all of our children, for Governor Strickland, are a moratorium uh, on uh, Pardon me, I'm reading the wrong thing. Recommended appropriations, uh, we're looking at the wrong thing. That's okay. Uh, if you can get the other full screen up. The three concrete recommendations that flow from this are a moratorium on new charter schools, a prohibition on for-profit management companies running charter schools, and a restriction on vouchers, which were just spread statewide, just to Cleveland and must be means tested. This is a big turn in yeah. policy of where we've been going. Well, it's a response of the governor to the people who supported him, and I can understand that. The <laughs> teachers unions, these, this is their policy. And I'm going to have Sue, oh, 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 wait a minute, hold on. I'm going to have <laughs> Sue Taylor on here the second part, so, so go ahead, be, go yeah, ahead. I'm sure she'll agree that the governor is uh, very but what, 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 uh, what the, the idea of vouchers, and the, the only thing they're been used for are for kids that aren't getting an education in public schools, and it provides an opportunity for them. Right here in Madisonville, kids were able to go to a Catholic school because of vouchers, because their school wasn't providing an education to them. Now they're going to be kicked out of the, the Catholic school and back in that public school that's not teaching them. And that's what the bad thing about this. Same way with charter schools, there's some problems with charter schools. There are some, I mean, we have, we have focused, we have focused schools. on this show time after time on problems. Not, our, look, but people job. haven't, yeah, yeah, people haven't that, stepped up. Dan, charter schools have been a disaster in the state of Ohio. And it's our tax dollars going into those charter schools and they're going to people and, and the profiteers are people like David Brennan who's giving hundreds of thousands of dollars if not millions of dollars to Republican cronies in the General Assembly who then expand charter schools even though we know that they're not working in the state. The governor's simply saying we're going to stop the expansion and we're going to make them play by the same set of rules that everybody else has to play by. You know, How one, can you challenge them? They need to be better than the public schools. But, one of, but they, they have to apply by was, the rules. That was the promise of charter schools. Right. Free them from the rules so that they could produce a better result. And they haven't done and that. They and they haven't. Generally, some have. But we've generally. paid for it. And, and why hasn't, you know, you had a Republican governor, a Republican-led legislature who pushed this, who want this, why wasn't th that 
system more aggressive about making the, the charter schools work. I mean, it, you know, now you've got a Democratic governor who doesn't believe in the charter schools. Let's face it. So and what, I are gonna, what are you going to do about that? I certainly agree with him that the, we need to have any charter well, schools if, or any schools in the state about, that provide a good education, no matter how they're, they're funded. You know, let's talk about school choice. It's interesting when the Republicans talk about school choice. It's about those poor inner city kids accessing other inner city schools. It's not about, well, let's open the Lakota school system. Let's open the Oak Hill school system. Let's open up all these suburban school Regionally. systems for inner city kids and let them go. I mean, you never hear that coming out of their mouth. School choice only applies to these poor inner city kids, and then we, the suburban legislators, are going to decide what's best for them and the, and the inner city taxpayers aren't going to get the choice when it comes to charter schools. I represent inner city time. schools as well. <laughs> and the governor believes in this because he's allowing it in Cleveland. He says the Cleveland kids can have but isn't that partly be, isn't that can't. partly because of the, uh, of the court Because rulings? of the Supreme Court. He doesn't want to violate the Supreme Court ruling as it applies to the Cleveland program, and therefore he's keeping it. And that's, it's a little different. There are other court rulings that he's challenging. Okay. Well, obviously this is just a huge... Uh, set of questions on the budget and this is going to continue for the next few months and this is a great introduction to this thank you for being here nice lively conversation this is, <laughs> this is what I like <laughs> stay tuned after the break we will continue this discussion of the future of education in Ohio with a Cincinnati woman who has been elected president of the Ohio Federation of Teachers Welcome back. As was obvious in our first segment, education is a central concern to Ohioans and all Americans from a policy, budgetary, and human perspective. Two weeks ago, the Ohio Federation of Teachers selected Sue Taylor as its new president. For the moment, she is filling in for the unexpired term of Tom Mooney, who died suddenly in early December. Ms. Taylor, has been the president of the Cincinnati Federation of Teachers since 2001 and taught in the Cincinnati Public Schools for 23 years. Sue, welcome back to Newsmaker. Thank you, Dan. We, uh, you weren't able to be here but uh, to hear it, but we had a bit of a lively discussion about some of the governor's proposals. My understanding when I talked to you last week that you were going to have a chance on last Friday, a week ago, uh, to talk to some of the governor's uh, officials, um, people in his office, about the budget as it, it impacts education. What is your general reaction to what the governor has proposed? Well, my general reaction is that we have a governor who's committed to public education in the state of Ohio and improving public education um, in the interest of raising democracy among our young people in the state and building our future. The governor mentions in uh, his State of the State the DeRolf decision, which the Supreme Court decided actually several times, and uh, calling for a new uh, funding mechanism, which got ignored. Now, he wants to increase the amount of state contribution up to 54%. Correct. It's now below 50%. Correct. That still isn't exactly following the DeRolf decision. What's your, what, what, from the, the teachers union point of view, what's your view on that? Well, my view on that is that we have a governor who at least recognizes that in the DeRolf decision, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled four times that the system, system of funding education is unconstitutional. Unfortunately, in the last ruling, the court did not um, retain jurisdiction over the issue. So unless the governor of the legislature acted, um, there was no teeth to the ruling. The governor now, Governor Strickland, is very aware of that. He sees his recommendations in this budget as being a first step toward getting to a constitutional system. Um, property taxes, he knows, need to be changed. I think um, his recommendation that people over 65 would be exempt from property taxes is a good first for step. For part of their property For tax. part of the property taxes, right. thank you. Um, but I think the governor right now is limited by the state budget. Um, resources are still very, very scarce. He does have time over the next several years 
um, to address the full Supreme Court ruling. What do you think about his recommendations about charter schools and the voucher program? Um, and I have to tell you, we don't have to go back and explain this because we talked about it in the first part, uh, but Senator Schuler made the point, well, this was political payoff to teachers unions and others who had supported uh, Governor Strickland. That's absolute nonsense. I think the governor is a man of integrity and he's acting on his own beliefs. He believes that the charter school system is fundamentally undemocratic. It's not held accountable in the same way as our traditional public schools. There has been very rampant fraud and abuse. Two billion dollars of state money has been poured down a rat hole. Fifty percent of all the charter schools in Ohio are rated in academic watch or below. Um, the teachers are less highly qualified according to No Child Left Behind. Um, almost a quarter of the charter schools are operating on the profit motive and my understanding, what I've heard the governor say is that um, that has a detrimental impact on the students. How can, how can profiteers make profits off of the backs of the very poorest children in the state. There's something fundamentally wrong with that picture and Governor Strickland understands that and believes that it's undemocratic. You mentioned No Child Left Behind. On the national level right now there is a discussion going on about uh, whether or not to renew No Child Left Behind, to modify it, what to do. What would be your personal and the union's perspective on that? Well, that is an issue that, of course, the Ohio Federation of Teachers, as well as the American Federation of Teachers, has been scrutinizing to the nth degree. Um, I think there is a problem with how AYP is calculated to measure students' growth. AYP. Average yearly progress. Average yearly progress. Um, it's measured only grades three through eight, math and science, or excuse me, math and reading. Um, what we need to do, Dan, is look at the value that's added in the child's education, measure that growth from the beginning of the year until the end of the year, and that's what we're advocating, so that we can systematically measure where a child began in, in, in her reading skills in grade three at the beginning of the school year and measure the progress till the end. That would be a more fair system of measuring growth. In No Child Left Behind, school systems like inner city school systems that have much more diversity uh, in terms of uh, economic levels, social backgrounds, uh, immigrant uh, participation, language issues as a result. All these subgroups are, are sort of evaluated separately. So a school, as I understand it, No Child Left Behind, an, a city school that has all these groups, they could overall be doing quite well, but if one area is falling down, they end up suffering from that. Am I, am I right on that? You are right on that, and it's not just the city schools, but the suburban schools as well. I personally believe that we do need to measure the progress of each subgroup. However, there appears to me to be a fundamental problem. Uh, Cincinnati Public, for instance, has approximately 19% of its students identified as special needs students. They have identified learning disabilities. Um, we're still required to test those students at grade level. Um, there was no forewarning to allow schools and teachers to plan for that. There are no interventions to assist those students. Um, that seems to be a fundamental problem. Um, in addition, we do need to be able to measure whether our impoverished students, our African American students, our Eng English language learner students, um, we need to be able to measure their progress. Um, however, one fundamental problem between the suburban districts and the urban districts is that the number of students in a subgroup um, in the suburban districts is so small that they don't meet the threshold for that group of students to be measured. And that is just a fundamental uh, flaw in the system. We can't compare apples to apples when our subgroups are large enough to be measured, but those in the smaller suburban districts are not. That's unfair. Which is why I asked the question the way I did. But anyway, be that as it may, we have probably only about a minute left here. Big question, what are your goals as the new president of the Ohio Federation of Teachers. And by the way, congratulations. Thank you so much. I think my goals are to get teachers um, better educated about state policies, about federal policies, 
get them more engaged in the debates around the governor's budget and ways to raise public education in Ohio and the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind. We've got a lot to do to make the teaching profession a true profession and that would be my goal. And how many, how many members are there? About. Dan. Uh, okay. Can that be done? <laughs> Bad question. <laughs> Quiz question. You're not, you haven't moved up all full time. So anyway, more importantly, congratulations. Keep coming back. Stay in touch and we'll have you. May I say there's 1.3 million members in the American Federation of Teachers. There we go. Okay. And some significant portion in Ohio. Thank yes. you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next Sunday when one of the topics will be the business of making film in greater Cincinnati. Have a good week.